start the board. Jacob and each of his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Napta, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered seven, numbered seventy in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. He takes breath. I'm going too fast. <laughs> I can tell. I've been living. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied great, and they became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king that did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will be more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies and fight against our, us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ram, Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the field. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for your word. And we pray as we study it that you help us to gather some insight and some understanding in your son's name. All right. Uh, this is a study that is, was going to begin last week, because you know I was not here. And so I asked Corey to just let me kind of consolidate. So we're going to do lesson one and part of lesson two, maybe all of lesson two, and then next week we'll finish two and go into three. So we'll kind of pull it all together and compact it. There's a lot of basic information in this first lesson that I kind of want to touch on. First of all, the book is written by who? Does anybody know? Moses. Moses. That's it. By Moses. Uh, or predominantly. I got to turn on the notes. Predominantly. Obviously, he got, uh, uh, some, well, actually, some of the things they think were edited or added in by maybe Ed's. Ezra later, or whatever, some notes or whatever, but basically the whole writing was pretty much by Moses. The Exodus means to do what? Leave. Leave. Exodus. <laughs> Something I remember. Exodus or departure. Uh, primarily, the book of Exodus is about the establishment of a people, a people that belong to God uh, as he was promised to do. Abraham. Abraham was promised that he'd be made a great nation. Well, here's the great nation. Up until now, it's been a family. It's grown and grown and grown. Now it's to a point that it is becoming a nation. So Exodus is about uh, a family that is now going to leave Egypt and become a nation. And the process of doing that, uh, they're going to be given laws, how to live the way God would want them to live righteously and some things that need to be done. We're going to see some of those things as we go through this. And one of the notes that I put down here is that uh, before they could be God's people, they had to leave the people of the world behind. They're living in the middle of Egypt, which was kind of one of the premier places at that time. They had to leave the world and all those trappings behind. In order to become a nation that belonged to God, they had to leave the nation that belonged to idol worship and all that behind. So all this is about a point of departure, separation, get, leaving the world behind so that God can establish a people in a nation, in a place that will belong to Him and live for Him and do the things that God intended in Genesis chapter 2. It's a people that will belong to God and serve Him. And so that's just what they're going to do. As a matter of fact, multiple times they were told, if you remember through our other studies, that they were never looked back to where? Egypt. Many times throughout the, this book and others, they're going to go, oh, I wish we were still in Egypt. As bad as it was, at least we had. You know, and all these things. They were told to never forget about the chariots, forget about the things or whatever. Quit looking back to Egypt because that is the world. So that's one of the things done here. All right. So here we are in 
They're here, and the book starts off where Genesis kind of leads off. It starts off with, okay, now uh, Joseph, and makes reference to him, brought his family to Egypt. Remember the circumstances. Famine, hunger, brought them there. But actually, Joseph got there by being uh, sold, but his family got there through the famine and everything. Uh, as we go through this, I'm going to use some people and some things by pharaohs and different things. I want you to understand there's a lot of different beliefs or understandings or theories as to who was who and who wasn't, where certain towns were and where they weren't, where Mount Sinai is and where it isn't. There is a lot of different views on that. And so the good thing about Exodus is it's not really determined based on that. It's about something more. But... What I've tried to do here initially is try to put some information together that corresponds with what is happening in the world as we take a look at this right now. Specifically, the Egyptian world. Uh, for dates and things, I used, uh, for Egyptian dates, I used the Egyptian history. They're the ones that knew when their pharaohs were there, for the most part, and wrote about them. When we talk about uh, the people of God, Israel, I used uh, dates out of the Bible. Because they're the ones there. And, it, and interestingly enough, if you think about it, history is written by people about themselves. Very seldom do you write a history about another nation or whatever, so you're not going to find a lot in Egypt about the Israelites, except maybe how it impacted them, or vice versa. That's why they have so much difficulty harmonizing different things, is because there's not just one master history book written that details all this stuff out. So I use those kind of dates, and I use some uh, uh, ideas that come straight from the Bible as far as locations, or general locations, because most of these towns, there's nothing, nobody really knows. They're guessing at them based on archaeology. So I want to kind of do that. And uh, based on the Bible, about 430 years before the Exodus, uh, which is what we're told in Exodus, we're actually told a different number in a different place. So 400 to 430 years before the Exodus, which would put us about 1886, plus or minus, it's not important, but generally speaking, it gives you an idea. We find that Jacob and his family, uh, uh, not descended, they settled in the land of Goshen. All right, where is Goshen? In the Delta, in the Del Nile Delta. If you remember anything about Egypt, then I don't have a map up here. Next week, we'll take a look at some pictures and some maps and some theory and stuff like that. So I will do that. I didn't want to get into that today and log it down tonight. But generally speaking, the, the Nile runs north to the uh, Mediterranean Sea. As it does, just like the Mississippi Delta, as the river gets into the flatlands, it fans out into this great uh, fertile land, this great for growing things. And that would be the Nile Delta. It's called the lower delta. Why? That's why it runs downhill. Of course, I'm pointing up because we always think north is up. <laughs> you know? But basically, which would be the northern part of Egypt. And there are basically two parts of Egypt. You have the delta region, and then you have the part that's farther south that's in the islands or whatever. Uh, Thebes, is one of the capitals, is in the islands. Memphis is another place. is near Cairo today. And that would have been uh, one of the places later established, later than this, uh, one of the places that uh, they were really family state. But anyway, generally speaking, this is it. So they settled in, in the land of Goshen. Not only is it in the uh, not, not Delta up here, but it's the eastern side of the Delta, toward what land? What's to the east? Israel, Palestine, Canaan at that time. Canaan. Land of Canaan over in that direction. And so as you look at it, that's basically the location it was. The Bible says that they built the store cities of Ramesses and Pithom. Nobody knows exactly where they are, but we're told uh, biblically, I think, that uh, Ramesses is <coughs> on the river, the eastern river of the delta that spreads out, which would put it up closer to that in that area, and then Pithom somewhere else. What is a store city? What, would, what is a store city? That's what they call it. Food. 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 
Hold the drain. It's a shopping center. If you want to go to town, you went there to get your, your stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, at this particular time, uh, we will set, uh, when you read Exodus, it says that the Israelites were responsible for building them. These uh, and building them up. Uh, during uh, Egypt's, what they call the Middle Kingdom period, keep in mind, Egypt lasted for thousands of years and did various things. But in the Middle Kingdom period, there is a group of pharaohs that uh, prior to this, they had pretty much had broken down control. Instead of having a pharaoh in control of the, uh, the entire Egypt, they had different fiefdoms, if you will, feudal system. They had different lands and territories that they had. And it's kind of a, a confederation of people, if you will. But during this period, when Joseph was there, we find that during this Middle Kingdom period, that the land uh, had came from being in these feudal systems and brought into central control. That's why this Middle Kingdom was so famous, is it brought them all into kind of control, under control of the Pharaoh. Now, if you remember from Genesis chapter 47, one of the things that Joseph did was they stored up grain in this area. As they stored up grain and the seven years passed and then the seven years of famine came, guess what, what happened? They came, yes. It started off by selling, uh, buying stuff to come to Joseph and the Pharaoh to buy food. Later we find, as you read through that, they didn't just come and buy it with their money. They ran out of stuff. So they turned around and gave the, the land to the Pharaoh. And as they gave the land to the Pharaoh, they would manage it and control it. Pharaoh uh, would take control of all of it. And that tells us that in Genesis, which coincides with this particular period of Egyptian history where... Uh, the pharaohs consolidated all the power into one place under the pharaoh. Okay? So we find that this took place at about this time. Uh, now, it also, not only did the people of Egypt come there for food, who else came? The world. Which, at that time, pretty much... To the east was where the major population was, was Canaan and Syria. They were kind of considered all the same, basically all of the eastern coast of the Mediterranean and around there. These people came down there, which included Jacob and his family. But it wasn't just Jacob and his family. They were without food, but everybody else up there didn't have it either. So they came too. So they had this great influx of foreigners that came into it from Palestine and Syria. Now, we don't know, in that first verse, it lists, uh, first five verses, it says that Joseph died, all these things took place. <clears throat> and number six, it says, uh, six and seven, it says, Joseph and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied. That's all it says about the next 430 years in Egypt, the Bible does. And so when we look at that, we also can look at the Egyptian history, and during this period of time, uh, after a period of time, uh, that kingdom kind of collapsed, and a group of people, as Billy mentioned, I think a couple weeks ago when I was here, the, the Hyksos uh, group of people came in from that area of Syria and Canaan, and they came into the land, into the upper, uh, which is the north, and they came in and pretty much took over half of Egypt. And as they came in, they brought in with them, as any people will do, what? Their customs, their cultures, and more importantly, their gods. And so they established a group of people here. Now these were Semitic uh, rulers, meaning they were descendants of the tribe of, I mean, from the people of Shem. Guess who Abraham was descended of? Shem. So we're talking about people that are related thousands, hundreds of years way back. But they're all interrelated and they're kind of referred to by race this way. So all these people come down into this place where Abraham, I mean, uh, Jacob's descendants are already living. They live in this particular place. They rule in this place. They rule part of Egypt. And uh, these Semitic rule, rulers rule from a place called 
of Varus. As you go through history and the different things, most people believe that is the same town that was later named Amasis, which is one of the store cities. In reality, the possibility exists this is the place where Joseph uh, resided initially. Later it was called Avery, which was the place that the Hindus come and took over the palace of the city. The, you know, that was the major metropolitan area. Was there was the store city. Took it over. They ruled from there. And then later on, we'll see it keep coming through history and later be named Ramesses. All right, as we look at this, um, they ruled from there. And the Pharaohs, the Hikos, with the Semitic rulers, ruled from the north, while the Pharaohs, or the Egyptian rulers, ruled in the south, from Thebes. Now, how do you think those people, those Hikos, I probably love his name, you just have to bear with me. I have problems with English, this is not even English. <laughs> Hyksos people, um, uh, how do you think the Egyptians felt about it? Not too good. They came from down there and, and, and invaded their land and took over the best part of it, so as far as the, the bountiful part of it. So they were not real happy with them uh, during this people, uh, during this particular time. They were hated. They changed their religion, they changed their culture, and true Egyptians did not like them at all. They weren't even of the same race. Uh, so we find that as we go into the next phase of Egyptian history, one of the, the first pharaoh of that period of the new king, what they call the new kingdom, a guy named Amos, he drove them out. 1550, this is about 100 years before the, uh, uh, what is most commonly <laughs> biblically matches up to about the time when the Exodus took place. So he drives them out. And as he does so, he pushes them out and begins a war that would take a thousand years with the, between Egypt and the people of Palestine and Syria. You remember, kings of Israel were caught in that battle between Egypt and Syria back and forth, you know, years, years down the road. And so Babylon finally ended it, quite frankly. But anyway, so basically this goes on, and uh, we find that. Uh, he drives them out, drives them back to Cain and back up towards Syria, and this conflict lasts about a thousand years. All right? Then we go down to the Bible. It says, And now, verse 8, then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. All right? Now, there are several different theories or people, you know, ideas, but it all depends. Most of those are based on archaeology. Well, we know this, we know that. I'm going strictly by the timeline of the Egyptians and the timeline of the, of, the, uh, of the Bible. Based on that, it would be at about the time of a guy named uh, Utmos the I. He would be this third pharaoh of this new kingdom period. The region had been controlled by the Hyksos up here in this uh, upper region. Uh, the middle kingdom that uh, Joseph was familiar with, all those pharaohs, long gone and been replaced by this Hiccos group for a hundred plus years. So any history is pretty much old, ancient, unknown. So we now have a Pharaoh in this next uh, period of time who comes along 400 years later. He doesn't know anything about a guy named Joseph. It's immaterial. And that would fit with exactly what uh, Moses tells us in this particular chapter. Alright. Now, uh, a thing of note, and we'll come back to it, but he was the father of a guy named Thutmose II and a, and a daughter named Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, those were his two kids, or two of his children, that he would have. In the Bible, we read that the Pharaoh feared the Israelites. Why? Too numerous. It wasn't that they were smart or they had any particular characteristic, except that they were numerous. There was a whole bunch of them. And so because of that, he feared them and is afraid that they might join who? His enemies. Who were their enemies? Those guys that were Semitic, Semitic, same race, that had been driven back to Canaan into Syria, and they were afraid that they might join their enemies 
And uh, since they were ethically and geographically connected to them, in their mind, they would have thought, yeah, we need to keep a good idea on these guys because this could be a major rebellion right in there. And it says that they were afraid that they would join their enemies and fight against us. The worst thing to have is a nation where you're the nation and you have this numerous population that rises up all together to, just, to take the entire region over. So they feared them, but they fight against us. But in addition to that, they were also afraid that they would do what? They would leave. If they didn't like it, why would they want to stay? Labor, workforce. You got all this fields and stuff out here that have to be taken care of, and all this produce center and everything in the Atlantic Ocean, and that was the labor force. The last thing you wanted to do is leave. Wasn't that one of the biggest uh, debates and arguments throughout our Civil War? It's about labor force. How are we going to get it done? You know, if it wasn't for that, there would have probably not been much of an issue, but it was all about that. It was an economical thing. When it comes to your food, do a lot of things. And so it was about that. They were afraid that they would either rise up and fight against them or they would turn around and leave. And then they would have nobody to work the fields. Alright? So in the process of this, uh, Pharaoh, uh, Moses tells us that Pharaoh decided to oppress them. He put slave uh, masters over them and says he made their lives bitter with hard work. And one of the things they did is they built up those store cities cities where the grain and everything would be traded and everything. Keep in mind it's just like we do today. You're out here and you're raising grain and stuff and then you turn around and you take it you put it on something and you take it to market. So you take it to this major market center and in this major market center you would take it and either sell it or you would sell it in bulk off to other communities. One of these, uh, Ramesses, uh, Ramses, it doesn't look spelled Ramses, but I heard it pronounced that way, whatever it is, uh, is located on one of the rivers of the Nile. And so it would have been a natural water place uh, for it to actually go upriver to Thebes and Memphis and all the other places in the upper region, which is south of Egypt, to provide for it or to be sold to other places, because it was also in a trade route between there and Canaan. Uh, so, uh, they built those store cities up. So, as they did this, uh, we find that the Pharaoh said, Let's, we're going to make, them, make work hard for them. We turn them into slaves. They beat them. They made their lives miserable and bitter. And the whole idea of being able to keep them under control, which is one way to do it. And that's what they were trying to do. <clears throat> But the Bible says that in spite of all of this, they continued to multiply. I thought that was interesting they said this, like this was going to stop them from multiplying. Uh, so uh, they continued to grow in numbers and in strength, and they became even more feared to the point that the king of Egypt sent out uh, the midwives that were working with these uh, women uh, that were having babies and had them do what? Told them do what to the babies? Kill them. Tell them kill them. When the, the baby boy was born of an Israelite, to kill him. The midwives didn't do it. God continued to bless them and Israel, and the king was all upset. So now he gave an order. Any Egyptian who saw a baby boy was to take it, that baby boy, and do what with it? Throw him in the river. Throw it in the Nile. Throw the river. And that brings us to chapter 2, which is our lesson to do get to that, and now all of a sudden we find that we come across <coughs> a man and a woman who are both a Levite. What does that mean? Do what? Levites. Levites, man. Matter of fact, one of their sons was Aaron. But yes, a descendant of Levi, one of the twelve brothers that was brought in with Joseph in the beginning. So they're descendants of Levi, both of the mother and the father. Does anybody know their name? It doesn't tell us here in chapter 2. There you go. You've got to remember your Bible stories. I remembered it and I thought, I remember that his name, but it's not here. Well, actually, it's a few chapters down later, it gives a, 
uh, descendants and stuff, and it tells you who it is. But yeah, Amram and Jochebed. And as we look at them, we say that, see that they had a couple children, which we already knew they did, had a daughter. What was the daughter's name? Miriam. And they had a son, Aaron. And now they have a baby boy that is born. The baby is taken, and for fear of being killed, the Bible says that the mother hides the baby for three months, probably in the home or wherever you could. But after a while, you can't hardly hide an infant from people finding out about it knowing. So the Bible says that she took a basket. She put tar and a pitch and made it waterproof, and then she put it out in the reeds of the river. Why would you do that? I do Nobody would see it out there and all the noise and the bustle and everything going on. Maybe nobody would notice it. The river was a common place for the women to go and to clean and bathe and uh, get water and to do all uh, the things that they did. So it was a common place there. So she would hide it there. And she had this his the baby's sister, Miriam, keep a lookout for her. Hopefully the, the baby would grow up enough to be able to live because they didn't want anyone to find the baby and kill him, throw him in the river. Alright? So, uh, one day while the baby was in the basket floating in the river, Pharaoh's daughter comes up. Now, Pharaoh's daughter, based on the timeline, would be this woman I mentioned a minute ago, Hatshepsut, uh, which was later would become very powerful, and her son would rule, and some things there, Billy alluded to that a couple weeks ago. And this woman here was Pharaoh's daughter, and she came and she saw, found the baby, and the Bible says she felt sorry for him. The baby was crying, felt sorry for him. Now, what was the edict from the king? Egyptians, kill the Hebrew babies. Throw them in the river. Instead, the Bible says she felt sorry for him. And in doing that, of course, we go find the mirror and comes running up and says, hey, I'll, I'll find your witness for her. And the lady says, yeah, that'd be good. And so now, the, uh, the baby is allowed to live in Goshen with its mother, as uh, raising it up as a small child, to be able to raise him and to teach him to do the things he needs to do under the protection of Pharaoh's daughter. So that's a pretty good thing that happened, divine providence, if you will. Uh, for that to take place. So as the, uh, so as the Bible grows, I mean, as the child grows older, then she is taken back to the palace and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter as her own son. As an adopted son. So she, we find the baby is raised in the palace, that the child is raised. Matter of fact, at that time we find that uh, Moses was given his name. Who gave him the name? Mother, I mean the daughter. <laughs> Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter gave me the name. I didn't realize that until I read this. Now. How many times have I read it? But anyway, she's the one that named him Moses, which means taken from the water. Uh, Dream out of the water. So she named him Moses, and she raised him as if it was, it was her own son. She raised him there in the palace uh, until the time when he was 40 years old. So he was raised in this palace with Pharaoh, with the daughter of Pharaoh as his mother, in a period where all this was going on and he could see what was happening to his people that he knew about from being raised there. As a matter of fact, in all likelihood, based on the fact that he was brought in and all that, Pharaoh knew good and well that he was uh, Hebrew, that he was one of it, an Israelite. Uh, so here he is, he's raised in the palace, and as we mentioned, this four city, I didn't mention it, but this store city of Ramesses uh, is also had the palace where the Hikas was at one time, and other people have ruled from there. So it was like a secondary palace uh, to the one in Thebes at that particular time. And so a lot of times the Pharaoh would rule from there as well as other places, just like we find in the uh, New Testament that the Romans had different palaces and different, where they would meet, and they would meet the population of that area. And so that was the same place. It's right there. The daughter of Pharaoh obviously came out of the palace to take a bath, so it had to be near there that they lived. And so they would have lived there, so Moses would have been raised up 
by the river, near his family, where all these things were taking place to the Hebrews, there where this, all this bitter slave labor was taking place. And so she raised him in the palace, and then at about 40 years old, the uh, Bible says he went out to watch his people at hard work. He just went out to observe and watch what was going on. So he's watched, raised, watching it, see what's going on. And while he's there, he comes across something taking place. What do you see? Yep. The Egyptian slave master beating one of his people for what he considered no apparent reason. And so the Bible says that he looked around and he saw nobody. There's obviously people around. So who did he not see? Egyptians. Didn't see any other Egyptian people, so he killed the man and hid the body. A few days later, he sees a couple of Hebrews out there arguing, and one of them is being is in the wrong apparently, and, and arguing with this other. And Moses tries to intervene. Said, "Why are you doing that with your brother?" Obviously, the, the Hebrews knew what he did, even though the Egyptians weren't around to see it. The Hebrews knew because they started going, "What are you going to do? Kill me too?" And all of a sudden, he realized he had a problem with that. Even his own people. That should have been his clue. That may be why he argued with God to not leave them so much. He you knew that they were not a very thankful bunch. I don't know. But, uh, so we find that because of that, he turns around and uh, uh, he finds out that the Pharaoh has discovered that he killed this Egyptian slave master. Now the Pharaoh knows whose side he's on. He's not, even though he's raised in the palace as one of his sons, or his daughter's son, as a royalty, he has turned on his own people because he is really a Hebrew at heart. Not just physically, but at heart. And so it says that Pharaoh set out to kill him, and therefore Moses does what? Moses runs. Runs as fast as he can. Which way does he go? That way. He went east. He took off out of the land of Goshen and headed east. He went over to the land of Midian. Now the land of Midian is basically Arabia. Saudi Arabia today, but it's basically the desert. Now there's some debate as whether it's in the peninsula, we call it Sinai, Sinai Peninsula, or over beyond that even, it bore into what is modern day Saudi Arabia, the desert there. Or uh, because those people, the Midianites, were all up in the desert, uh, uh, the Sinai cross over into the Arabian Desert and all the way up east of uh, Israel and Canaan, to be honest with you, between them and, and over the Babylon, where Babylon was, in that whole desert region. And so we find that he flees over there, and he goes, uh, leaves his people, doesn't know what to do, he goes over there where nobody knows him, and while he's there, he witnesses some women that are being mistreated, they come to water their flock, and as they water their flock, uh, we find that uh, a bunch of shepherders, shepherds Sheep herders, shepherds, uh, push them away. Just women push them away until they get their sheep around there for watering and everything. This was their business. And these women had no business there in their mind. Moses steps in, defends them, and allows them to be able to get to water their sheep. He finds out that these are the seven daughters of a Midian priest, Midianite priest, named Ruel. Ruel finds out what he has done for him, and in order to thank him and to bless him, invites him into his family. Not only invites him into his family, gives him one of the daughters. It's here. Here's your wife. We find that Moses has a son. He's going to spend about 40 years there. So we find him over in Midian at this particular time. He's fled there, and he's gone there. All right. That's the first chapter. After two, chapter two. That gets Moses raised and over there, and we set this up for situations that are about to take place next week. A couple things I want to think about. Some lessons. First of all, Romans 8 28 says what? Make close. For the good of the people, those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's a long thing for all things work for good. For all things, all those who are called. Anyway, we know that all things together work together.
together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to His purpose. Those who are, there you go. A lot of times I've heard this, and I've, we've talked about this in the past, and I'm going to reiterate it here because it's a perfect time to see it. That a lot of times I've heard this used, and I just cringe when people say, I know it's bad for you today, that all things are going to work for your good. That's not what Paul was saying. He's not talking about your good. He's talking about the good of the people as a whole. God's people, those who are calling for his purpose. You can look at that in this particular instance. Think about Joseph. It all starts with Joseph. Good things happen to Joseph, right? He gets thrown in a pit. He gets drugged into slavery and sold multiple times in Egypt. Was it for his good? No. Eventually it worked out that he kind of got pretty rich and powerful. But all that was not to his good, and he didn't see one good thing happening with it until near the end of his life. But as he does, as this takes place, we also find that his father, Jacob, and all of them are suffering through famine. Their land, the place, their home, is no longer a place to live. And all that famine and all those things that were going bad for them, they had to leave and go to a place in Egypt and start over. Good thing? Not at the time. Maybe it's generations down the road. But even farther down the road, we find that those same people face what from Pharaoh? Bitter, bitter, bitter persecution. Hard labor. Very abused situation. Is that good for them as a person? No. But God used that circumstance in order to better for the good of his people as a whole. Every single one of these things add up as God looks toward his people as a whole and tries to use things for good. As we go through the next weeks and go through that, we're going to see that as a, a predominant plan. Another thing I want to bring out real quickly is this. Hebrew. Hebrew, the term Hebrew is not used very much in the Old Testament. We use it more in the New than it was in the Old. It was kind of a it was actually a slur for the most part. It was kind of a talking bad about a person. Uh, some think it came from the descendants of Eber, which is one of Shem's descendants down the line, which Abraham was a part of, but a bunch of uh, family Sem Semitics came from. We find that the, the daughter of Pharaoh says that's one of them he Hebrew babies. The idea of being, you know, one of those low-class, not any good dog kind of people, babies. That was the kind of use for it at that particular time. We find in the book of Judges that term is used in the same negative context. Later on, the people would embrace it, and it would become a uh, symbol of pride. But it, up until then, it was pretty much referring to those people in a, a negative way. So when this woman refers to these as being Hebrew, Hebrew or Hebrew, uh, babies, and they look at them, they're also thinking in their mind, you know, those uh, Semitics from Canaan, those dogs that came down here from Canaan and Syria and took over our country and we ran them out, and we're now out trying to destroy them. Matter of fact, these pharaohs were waging wars to, uh, historically during this time with them trying to destroy, uh, wipe them out over there. And so uh, we find that this was a uh, term of derision, something that they did not like. They kind of lumped them in with the rest of uh, the Israelites and lumped them in with the rest of those uh, Semitics from that region, that area that came from them. And they didn't think much of them. They were not Egyptian. Not Egyptian. There's a tremendous amount of nationalism and race, racism, if you will. So there's a couple things to think about. All right. Talk a little bit about the history. Don't get hung up on it. It's more trying to paint a story based on some historical things. Don't get hung up on the names and the dates as much as you But generally, these are some of the things that were going on at that time that fits exactly with what the Bible was talking about. A lot of people argue that, well, this here, they get up in trying to find a particular city or a particular artifact. Well, All right. Any other comments, thoughts? All right, next week we're going to find that uh, Moses has an encounter in Midian.